All right, Mosaic, good morning. How you doing? You good? Hey, uh, my name's Ben, Ben Foote. I'm a pastor out in Colorado. Okay, I'm a friend of Mosaic. Mosaic's been a friend to me. Um, I'm one of those people, genuinely, I'm rooting for you, praying for your community, cheering this place on from like halfway across the country. Um, so I'm, I feel very honored and excited to be here today. Uh, but I'm not going to do some long introduction about myself. I'd love to meet you. I'll be chilling out in the lobby after this. Please come say hi or I'll just be lonely all day. Um, but I'm, I'm very pumped to be here. Um, I'm, I'm really pumped that Jonathan asked me to come during this series, okay? Because doubt has played a really huge role in my life, in my faith journey. It still plays a huge role in my faith journey. I, I love that you're doing a series on doubt, okay? That doubt has become this taboo thing for a lot of churches and a lot of faith communities. It freaks a lot of Christians out for some reason. Um, and so I love that you decided to jump into this and, and do a series on doubt because it's easy for us to assume that because it feels so taboo, it's easy to have a bad assumption that like real Christians, mature Christians don't ever doubt, right? It's this idea that like faith and doubt are mutually exclusive, right? You can do one or you can do the other, but you definitely can't do both at the same time. The problem though is that every single person in this room has had, or if you're being honest, currently has your own doubts, right? You've got questions. You, you've got concerns. There are aspects of following Jesus that you're having a tough time wrapping your mind around. And then we all have valid reasons for our doubts, okay? It, it's like we're not trying to be antagonistic toward Jesus or towards the idea of faith. We've just, we're just being honest with our questions and we're not sure what to do about them. And so I love that you guys are doing a series on doubt. Jonathan, over the last two weeks, has done an awesome job of explaining that, yes, you can follow Jesus even though you have doubts. The two things, faith and doubt, are not mutually exclusive. And I hope that that's been like a really freeing truth for a lot of you. But for today, I actually want to tackle a, a unique question. And, and my question goes something like, like this. It's like, okay, sure, okay, we can follow Jesus even though we have doubts, but my question is, does Jesus bench us while we have doubt? And here's what I mean. Um, I'm a massive baseball nerd. Like, it's a problem. Um, like, I, I follow the Cleveland, I follow the Cleveland Guardians. That's the team I inherited, which is unfortunate. I, I know a lot of suffering in my life. Um, <laughs> But so I'm a big baseball, like it's bad. Like I, I own score books. I score 162 Cleveland games a year. Like that's what I have to hand my children. <laughs> You're like, here's your inheritance. And I'm like, here's some score books. Um, so I'm a big baseball nerd. If you follow baseball, which you should, by the way, because the O's got the best uniform in baseball. Um, also, I got to go to Camden Yards for the first time last night with my buddy Sam. You've got one of the best ballparks in America. So cool. I'm nerding out, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> if you follow baseball, you know that they'll bench a player, like especially a pitcher, for injuries that sound like no big deal, right? Like sore elbow or tight hamstring. One time they benched a Cleveland pitcher, I'm not kidding, because he had a hangnail, all right? And the idea, of course, in baseball and most other major sports is they want you to, to, to recover from your minor injury now rather than risk it becoming a major injury that will knock you out for the whole season, right? So they don't want your sore elbow to become Tommy John surgery or your tight hamstring to get torn. They don't want your hangnail to become whatever hangnails become. I, th I, think, <laughs> I think they'd become bad hair days, maybe. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so the manager sees your injury and just immediately it's like plop, he sits you on the bench. And that's my question today with this whole faith and doubt stuff. It's like, does Jesus see our doubts and then immediately like plop, sit us on the bench? And not from a place of being mean, of course, um, but from a place of him going like, hey, I love you, you're still on the team, but for right now, you're not in the game. Okay, for right now, just sit, relax, find some answers to some of your questions and recover. The question is basically like, cool, we get to go to heaven when we die, even though we doubt. That's good to know. But my question is like, can Jesus even use us while we're actively doubting? I feel like that's a fair question, and that's what we're going to dig in today. To, to truly dig into this idea, we first have to tackle a really bad idea that's been floating around Christianity for far too long now. It's the bad idea that Christians must have blind faith. You've probably heard that before. 
Let's unpack that. This idea that Christians are supposed to have blind faith usually comes from a couple Bible verses that are almost always ripped out of their context, and chief among these is Hebrews 11, verse 1, which goes like this. It says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. And it's like, I agree. I agree. Okay, I, I've never seen Jesus physically with my own two eyes, right? And, and I don't know how he's going to repair my heart. I'm a mess, right? And I don't know how he's going to repair and fix the world. It's a mess. I haven't seen any of it, but I'm confident that I will. That's faith, right? Faith, faith by nature is trust and confidence in things unseen. And all of us have faith. We display faith all day long, all of the time. Okay, we display lowercase f faith all of the time. So for example, yesterday I flew here on an airplane and I, I didn't meet the pilots. I don't know their first names. I didn't check their credentials. I had trust and confidence that these people went to airplane school, or <laughs> however that works. <laughs> um, and, right, and you drove here today. You had trust and confidence that your brakes would work. You don't inspect them every single time that you jump in the car. That's, that's faith. On top of this, everyone in this room, everyone in the world has capital F religious faith, even if you think you don't. All right, in this room, you've got a lot of Christians. Other people have put their faith in Mormonism or Buddhism, still others in like astrology and some in, in politics. And some would say that they don't believe there's a God, which is an act of great faith because you're, trust, you, you, you're confident in saying that, but you can't see it or believe it. That's faith. And so everyone has put their faith in something. Okay, as for me, personally, I've put my faith in Jesus, but even though my faith is trust and confidence in things unseen, at the same time, I don't have blind faith. That's because blind faith means something very specific in our culture. Blind faith is unquestioning belief in something, even when it seems to be unreasonable or wrong, and I do not have blind faith unquestioning belief in something, even when it seems to be unreasonable or wrong, like you're not allowed to ask any questions about Jesus or faith, the thing that I would say is the most important thing going on in the whole world, not allowed to question your faith when life gets really hard, not, not allowed to question your faith when Christians are acting unreasonably or your church is doing something wrong, like unquestioning belief in something, even when it seems to be unreasonable or wrong, that is blind faith. You know who's asking for blind faith? It is dictators and cult leaders. I'm not interested in following either one of those. Okay, but then what Christians do is, is sometimes a lot of Christians, they take this idea of blind faith and then they wear it like a badge of honor. Right? As if it's honorable to just never question what you were taught. As if it's honorable to kind of plug your ears and close your eyes and hum to yourself that God is good even though you don't believe it right now because you're suffering. As if it's honorable to like look the other way when the pastor is acting out of line because, you know, God placed them in leadership for a reason and who am I to question God's decisions? Listen, it's not honorable to play pretend in air, any area of your life, especially in faith. I just don't, I don't believe it's honorable to, to deal with difficult questions about faith by ignoring them. I don't believe it's honorable to, to handle suffering with a fake smile and a fake prayer on your lips. Like, if you can handle suffering with a real prayer on your lips, you're well on your way, but don't fake it. And then I definitely don't think it's honorable to blindly accept spiritual authority from any human being on planet Earth. All right, Mosaic is a great church. Jonathan is a fantastic pastor. You should be really thankful for those things. Don't take them for granted. They're hard to find. But at the same time, Mosaic and Jonathan, they don't have, they would never say that they have spiritual authority over your life. You're under the authority of Jesus and Jesus alone, whether you've bowed to him yet or not, and he's the only authority that you've got to answer to. This is why so many people get hurt by churches and pastors. It's because too many other people looked the other way whenever they saw red flags and warning signs within their church leadership. And guess what? Usually they call that reckless, like, lack of discernment and lack of courage, they call it faith. I was just trusting the leadership that God put in place. Listen, here's a tough pill to swallow, but we might as well take this medicine while we're here. 
God didn't ordain every single pastor who has an ordination certificate hanging in their office. Jesus is not asking for your blind faith. He's not asking for blind faith in him. He's definitely not asking for blind faith in his church. But then some of, some of us right now, you're going, yeah, but, but what about Hebrews 11.1? 1? Because remember, Hebrews 11.1, 1, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. There's some of us going, yeah, that still kind of sounds like blind faith. Well, it's not, and here's how we know it's not. If later today you were to go read the rest of Hebrews 11, which you should totally do, you should do that later this afternoon, what you're going to see is a list of men and women who had stand-up faith. Hebrews 11 is kind of like taking a tour through the faith hall of fame. You're going to see a ton of big names in there. Like, even if you've never read your Bible, you're going to know these names. Noah, right? And Moses, and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and, and David, and Solomon, to name a few. Okay, so the, you'll find these people who had stand-up faith in Hebrews 11. At the same time, they're all people that you can go read about in the Old Testament. Their lives are literally open books, warts and all. And so basically, the author of Hebrews says, here's what faith is. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. And then right after that, he goes, and here's a list of people who had faith like that. And he goes on to list a bunch of people who, yes, had great faith, but also had great failures, great weaknesses, great questions, and massive doubts. In other words, in Hebrews 11, you find that apparently big faith and big doubt can somehow go hand in hand together. And to explore that idea, I want to zoom in on the life of one of the men mentioned in Hebrews 11, a man named Moses, because Moses is a case study in doubt and spiritual insecurity, and yet he's listed in the hall, Faith Hall of Fame in Hebrews 11. Some background on, on Moses, okay? Personally, I love Moses. I love him so much. Like of all the people in the histories of the Old Testament, I, I think I love Moses the most. It's because I identify with him the most. Some of you are like, that's a little cocky. This dude thinks he's Moses. <laughs> um, you would only say that if you have the wrong picture of Moses in your mind, okay? Because I don't know what it is. Maybe it's from like little children's Bibles or movies or whatever. We tend to picture him as like this Charlton Heston-esque kind of guy. Like, he, you know, he's tall, strong, perfect beard. Like he's a dynamic leader and determined and confident. That's just, it's just not an accurate picture of Moses. That's not who we're about to see in our story today. Moses' life leading up to the moment that we're going to read together today, his life leading up to this moment has been crazy. Okay, to summarize it, he's an Israelite born in Egypt at a time when the Israelites are slaves to the Egyptians, so he's born as a slave, but then he ends up getting adopted by Pharaoh, the, the king of Egypt, by Pharaoh's daughter. So Moses becomes Pharaoh's adopted grandson, and for 40 years, Moses lives like a literal prince in the house of his people's oppressor. That's enough to mess you up. Right, until, until one day, he's walking around, he sees an Egyptian beating up an Israelite. Something snaps inside of Moses. He has a moment where he identifies with the Israelites, his people. He rushes the Egyptian, and he murders him. This makes Pharaoh, grandpa, very angry. Okay, so he puts a warrant out for Moses' arrest. Moses flees Egypt, goes to the middle of nowhere, a place called Midian. He meets a nice lady, marries her, settles down, working for his father-in-law as a shepherd, and that becomes Moses' life for another 40 years. And you don't have to have a degree in psychology to realize that kind of life will mess a person up, right? Moses has been a lonely, confused, scared insecure man for his entire life. Now he's a shepherd in the middle of nowhere. He's got nothing better to do than just stare at sheep all day and feel sorry for himself. And he's got nothing better to do than constantly ask, like, God, why did you give me the life that I have? He's got the same doubts that a lot of us have. Moses is going, and this is going to sound familiar to some of us, Moses is going, God, if you're truly in control, you seem to be doing a bad job of it with my life. Moses is in a place of deep doubt and spiritual insecurity, and it shows in the moment that we're going to look at together right now. This is in Exodus chapter 3. We don't, don't have time to read the whole thing together, but I'm going to kind of highlight some verses and summarize everything else that happens in between. 
Okay, so one day, Moses is out tending his sheep. He comes across in the wilderness a bush that's on fire, and Moses does what literally 100% of the men in this room would do. Moses sees fire, and he's like, I will go stand closer to the fire (laughs) and stare at it, (laughs) because that's what we like to do. So Moses is drawn to the fire. He starts walking towards it. When he gets close, God speaks to him from the flames. And God tells Moses that he's heard the Israelites calling out to him and he's concerned with the suffering of his people. He's actually gonna set the Israelites free from slavery and give them a land of their own. And here's the kicker, Moses is gonna do, or God is gonna do all of that through Moses. Like Moses was just handpicked by God to play one of the most important roles in the history of the Israelites. And I like to think that if I heard God's voice from a burning bush, that would be enough for me and it would be enough for you to be like, all right, I'm in, let's do it, I trust you. But remember, Moses has spent a lifetime doubting and questioning whether or not God is good and in control. And so Moses asks God a series of questions that we're gonna look at together right now and they're all questions that are based in doubt. First thing Moses says to God, he goes, who am I? Right, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? In other words, Moses goes, listen, God, like you've got the wrong guy. I'm not cut out for this. God responds by saying, Moses, who you are doesn't matter as much as who I am, and I am going to go with you. You're not going to be alone. Moses responds to that with another doubtful question. This one's actually a very gutsy question. Look at this, Moses said to God, he goes, okay, suppose I do what you say. Suppose I I go to the Israelites and I say to them, hey, the God of your fathers has sent to me, but then what if they, they ask me, well, what's his name? If they ask me what's his name, then what do I tell them? In other words, Moses just goes, okay, cool. God, so I'm not supposed to be nervous about going to Egypt because you're gonna go with me. Great, who are you? I don't know your first name. Where you been the last 80 years of my life? It's a very gutsy question. God stays patient with them, though. He goes, hey, God says, I am who I am, all right? I'm the Lord. I'm the God of of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. That's who I am, and again, I'm gonna go with you. You're not gonna be alone. And then to ease Moses' mind, God gives him a detailed plan of everything that's about to happen. How much, I would kill for that, wouldn't you? (laughs) Like, for God to be like, hey, here's like a detailed plan of the next year of your life. Oh my gosh, I would love that. He does that with Moses. He goes, here's who you're gonna talk to when you get to Israel. Here's how I'm gonna, or when you get to Egypt. Here's how I'm gonna free the Israelites from slavery. He's essentially promising Moses success. Moses doesn't believe any of it. Look, Moses answered, okay, what, what if they don't believe me? What if they just don't believe? Or what if they listen to me and they say, yeah, the Lord didn't appear to you. Yeah, you're, you're crazy. This question comes on the heels of God's detailed plan for Moses. And so, in other words, Moses just said, okay, God, I understand. That's what you think is going to happen. But what if you are wrong? God, again, stays patient. With Moses. He gives Moses a series of miraculous signs to prove his words. Like one of them is he can turn his staff into a snake and then back into a staff again. How does Moses respond to the literal miracles occurring before his eyes? He responds with more doubt. Moses said to the Lord, oh Lord, like I've never been eloquent, like neither in the past nor since you've spoken to your servant, not even in this conversation. I'm slow of speech and tongue. At this point, Moses is grasping for straws. He's out of excuses, right? So he basically, Moses goes, yeah, but God, I'm not a good public speaker. Like, I'm not really equipped for this. So like, you might wanna go find someone else. And God responds to Moses with sarcasm, which that always makes me happy. God God looks at Moses and goes, Moses, I made your mouth, dude. I know, I know what I'm working with. (laughs) And then finally, finally, Moses quits beating around the literal bush and he cuts to the chase, and he shouts out the thing that he's been hinting at throughout this whole conversation with God. In desperation, Moses shouts out, and he goes, oh Lord, just please send someone else to do it. God, I just, I don't wanna do this. What you're asking of me is crazy. Pick someone else, go find someone else to do your dirty work for you. 
It's gutsy, risky. This is the only point in the story where we're told that God gets furious. He burns in anger towards Moses. But like a good parent, God doesn't respond out of his anger. He takes a breath. He ends up giving Moses a partner to go with him back to Egypt. And then finally, Moses, exhausted, terrified, having just lost an argument with God, he finally saddles up and he heads to Egypt. Now, we have this tendency to view people in the Bible as heroes. We should stop doing that. Okay? There's only one hero in that book. His name is Jesus. The rest of the people in the book are, they're a mess, like you, like me. All right? Moses is a mess. Uh, here's a question for us. During Moses' encounter at the burning bush that we just looked at, where does Moses display any faith? Where's his faith? I mean, I, I won't nerd out here for long, but ever since the Age of Enlightenment in the 18th century, we've turned the idea of faith into a purely intellectual quality, right? Faith is belief. Faith is understanding. Faith is finding answers. By that standard, when does Moses display any faith? When is the moment where he's like, oh, I get it. Okay, this is starting to make sense now. Thanks for answering my questions, God. When is that moment? It doesn't happen. I mean, here, here's the truth. If faith is only believing and understanding and getting answers, then Moses displayed zero faith at the burning bush that day. And yet there he is in Hebrews 11, listed among the men and women of great faith. So where was the faith moment for Moses? And this is what we've been working toward together the whole morning. His faith moment is in Exodus chapter 4, verse 18. After trying his best to weasel out of God's commands and after asking question after question and getting none of the answers that Moses wanted to hear and after losing an argument with God, here is where we finally see the faith of Moses. Moses went back to Jethro, that's his father-in-law, and he said to him, let me go back to my own people in Egypt and just to see if any of them are still alive. And Jethro's like, go, great, I wish you well. And so Moses took his wife and sons, put them on a donkey, and started back to Egypt. Moses is listed in Hebrews 11 as a man of great faith, not because he had great understanding, answers, or even belief. He had none of those things at the burning bush that day. Instead, Moses is a man of great faith because even in the midst of all of his doubt and spiritual insecurity, he put his family on donkeys and he did what God told him to do. This is so important for us to wrap our minds around in the 21st century, especially for any of us who feel like Moses, that we're not getting any of the answers that we wanna hear, and we, we don't understand everything. In fact, it feels like we barely understand anything, and it feels like we do nothing but argue with God right now. If that's you, you need to hear this. Moses is proof that those things don't disqualify you from a life of faith. How is that possible? Well, it's because, yes, Many times, faith is belief and understanding and finding answers, but also many times, faith is simply showing up. It's showing up. What I mean, faith is simply doing what God says to do, trying to live the life that Jesus teaches us about. Faith is sometimes just being obedient even when we don't understand anything even when we don't have the answers when we, that we want, even when our faith can be characterized as one big argument with God right now. Moses displayed faith at the burning bush because he left the burning bush. He displayed great faith because even though he felt like what God was telling him to do was, was crazy and he didn't understand it all, he did it anyway. He showed up. And when it comes to the Faith Hall of Fame in, in Hebrews 11, we chose to zoom in on the life of Moses. We could have zoomed in on anyone in Hebrews 11 because you see this kind of faith showing up in the midst of doubt and confusion in every single person listed in the Faith Hall of Fame of Hebrews 11. David. Uh, David wrote all the best psalms and songs about doubt. 
He wrote lyrics like, how long, O Lord, how long? Are you gonna sit around and ignore me forever? That's in the Bible, King David wrote that. King David was a absolutely confused leader, king, and father who failed a lot. In fact, one of his sons hated him so much that this son slept with all of David's wives on the roof of the palace just to stick it to dad. I know that you, like me, feel like a bad dad some days. That hasn't happened on your roof, <laughs> right? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> I'm gonna, of course, I'll talk to someone in the lobby. He's like, dude, well, <laughs> have I got a story for you. <laughs> That's David's life. David is a man of great faith. Abraham, okay, Abraham, God promised Abraham that his family would become as large as a nation. Abraham doubted it because he and his wife Sarah were barren, and so he doubted it to the point of sleeping with his maidservant. Maybe that's how his family was going to start. Uh, God promised Abraham that he would give Abraham a land of his own. Abraham doubted that God would protect him until the time that he got that land. So not once, but twice. While traveling through a big city, Abraham passed his wife off as his sister because she was beautiful and he didn't want to die on her behalf. Like, I, I, I don't know if you're catching that. Abraham pimped his wife out twice. Like, you're spouse of the year. <laughs> and that's a man of great faith? Solomon, he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. It's like reading the private, personal diary of a person having a faith crisis. Samson is listed in Hebrews 11. Guys, I can't think of one thing Samson did right other than show up. <laughs> These people in, in Hebrews 11, they're people with huge failures, huge weaknesses, huge questions, and massive doubts. But Hebrews also tells us that they had huge faith. Why? Because they were obedient. They showed up even in the midst of their doubt and their failure and shortcomings. They didn't have answers. They didn't have understanding. And a lot of times, they didn't even have belief. But they did what God told them to do. Because sometimes faith is simply showing up. We started this thing with, with the question, like, does Jesus bench us when we doubt? And honestly, it feels like he should right? That, that feels like the wise thing to do. I mean, think about Moses in, in our baseball metaphor, right? If you had like a starting pitcher like Moses, go up to the manager and go like, hey, so, you know, I don't really think I'm the right guy to start the game today, and I don't even, in fact, know if you're very good at your job. It doesn't seem like you know what you're doing, um, and I, in fact, I'm just not good at pitching to begin with, and the bottom line is I just don't want to do it today, so go find someone else to start your baseball game. What we would assume is that any good manager would bench that player. In fact, we would kind of assume that that player would be cut from the game or cut from the team, but what we see in, in Moses is that God is the manager. He's the coach going, I hear you. I hear you, Moses, but get in the game. Yeah, I know, that's a great question, Moses. Get in the game. Yeah, I know, it's very confusing. Get in the game. And then finally, Moses does get in the game. He puts his family on donkeys and he heads towards Egypt. He shows up. What happens next? Well, through Moses, again, remember, fix your mind. Not Charlton Heston, through Moses. Like, sad sap, feeling sorry for himself, whiny, distrustful, argumentative Moses. Through Moses, God does mind-blowing things. Through Moses, God sets his people free from slavery. And, and through Moses, God splits the Red Sea in half. And through Moses, God leads his people through a barren wilderness and into a promised land. God wasn't asking Moses to believe. He wasn't asking Moses to understand. He wasn't asking Moses to have all the answers to all of his questions. What was God asking Moses to do? He was asking Moses to show up so that God could show off. And that's exactly what Moses did. And so even though it sounds like a paradox at first, Moses, the man of great doubt, is a man of great faith. And that idea, you don't just see it in the Old Testament, you see it up into the New Testament and up until 2024. Like there's this moment in the Gospel of Matthew 
probably almost everyone's at least kind of familiar with this. It's pretty famous. It's called the Great Commission. This is after Jesus has been resurrected. He gives a command to a group of people, and Jesus says this. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Those are the very last words out of Jesus' mouth in the book of Matthew, and we like those verses, right? He sends his people on mission, super inspirational. We love those verses. We almost always ignore the verse that happens right before the Great Commission, where we're told that when they, the crowd, saw Jesus, they worshiped him, but some doubted. That's, That's the crowd that Jesus gave the Great Commission to, people who believed and also people who doubted they understandably didn't quite have their minds wrapped around resurrection just yet. It happened like five days ago, right? He gave this command to people who believe and also people who doubt. He said, go get in the game. Go show up. People were in that crowd going, yeah, but Jesus, how is this even possible? Like, how are you back from the dead? And Jesus is going, I know, it's crazy, right? Like, so go get in the game. Go tell other people about it. And they're going, yeah, but Jesus, like, I'm confused. Like, I don't understand any of this. Yeah, I know. It's crazy confusing, but it's also super good. So go, get in the game, baptize people in my name. Jesus is carrying the torch that he carried all through the Old Testament. He is looking at people who are broken and confused and full of doubt, and he's saying to them, if you think me coming back to life is crazy, wait till you see what I do through your life. So get in the game. And so I'm challenging myself today with the same challenge I'm going to throw to you, okay? If God can do amazing things through a man like Moses or through the very first doubtful Christians in history, then what might he do through us? What might he do through you? Yes, even though you're in the middle of an argument with him. And yes, even though you don't know how to reconcile parts of the Bible with historic and scientific discovery. And and yes, even though you're suffering right now, and so you're struggling to believe that God is good and in control. Like, what might happen if we show up so that God can show off? What could happen? Like, this is a really beautiful truth about Jesus' kingdom. It's the truth that you might be confused right now, but you're not benched in the kingdom of heaven. So keep asking great questions, keep seeking the answers, but in the midst of all of that, keep showing up and seeing what God can do through you. What does it look like to show up so that God can show off? Well, that looks different for everyone, okay? I I really can't answer that question for you. Only you can answer that question for yourself. Here are some ideas, though, maybe some examples. Okay, for some of us, showing up is just dragging yourself back here every single Sunday to continue exploring the idea of faith even though you don't want to. For you, maybe that's what showing up looks like. For others of us, like it's time to jump in and get involved in this community, like lead a small group. You're like, dude, I don't have all the answers. Great, we're not asking for you to have all the answers. Like what if your group just needs a safe place to ask good questions? Some of us are going, I don't even believe in Jesus yet. Great, volunteer with the guest experience team. Like they they have roles for people who aren't sure what they believe yet. They have those roles so that you can have an opportunity to show up and see if God shows off in your life. For others of us, throughout the series, we're going like, okay, um, it seems like maybe I can follow Jesus even though I doubt a lot of this. And, and you're about to see four people get baptized in just a few moments. And so you're like, maybe I want to get baptized. Great, check the baptism box on your connection card and someone will reach out. And then for all of us, all right, showing up also includes stuff that has nothing to do with mosaic. Okay, showing up is, is having the conversation with your spouse that you've been putting off for a really long time. And and showing up is coming clean with your boss on the way that you've been taking shortcuts at work. Like, showing up is doing the right thing, even though it's hard, and then trusting God with the consequences. For some of us, showing up means you just, you gotta go forgive the person who hurt you, or you've gotta go apologize to the person you hurt, or showing up is making dinner for the neighbors who are grieving, or paying for your buddy's car repairs because he can't right now. Like, those are just examples. I don't know what showing up looks like for you as an individual specifically. All I know 
is that unquestioning and total belief is not a prerequisite for doing what God is telling you to do. And so do it. Go get in the game. Go show up so that God can show off. And who knows, maybe just maybe, and I'm willing to bet that this will be the case, but maybe just maybe, after witnessing the kinds of things that God can do in your broken life, well then maybe you might just grow in your faith more than if you had gotten all the answers to all your questions in the first place. Let's pray. God, I thank you for this moment right now. I thank you for this church. God, thank you for a place where we can talk about doubt. You're not scared of doubt. You're strong enough to handle all of our questions. I mean, Moses is, is proof. Like, you're strong enough to handle when we lash out, when we get angry with you. Yeah, you're not freaked out by our doubt. And so we as a church don't need to be freaked out by doubt either. So God, thank you for this place, this place where we can ask the questions that we've got. We can wrestle through this idea of doubt. God, I thank you for the kind of God that you are, where you take those of us who are doubting, and because of Jesus, you go, yeah, that doesn't separate you from me anymore. And so you welcome us into your arms with all of our questions and with all of our concerns. And and you teach us the truth that, man, doubt is faith. Doubt is faith being exercised and tested and strengthened. So, So God, thank you for holding us close, even when we doubt, even when we've got questions. God, for those of us who are sitting in the room and we're struggling, like we understand it with our minds, but it doesn't really feel like it's sinking into our hearts. Can you do what only you can do? It's like a a pastor can't do this, a sermon can't do this, a worship song can't do this. Only you can take truth and move it from our heart and like plant it and root it, or move it from our mind and plant it and root it into our hearts. So God, would you do that for the people in this room who are going, yeah, but I just, I think that my questions disqualify me from following Jesus. God, would you teach them your truth and your grace? God, I love you very much, and I pray this in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen.